lack of information on you know uh, toxic algal species and distribution. Uh, navigation operation hazards, again, uh, like I mentioned, it could be collisions in the ocean. You know, not that science could help with that, but then there are uh, areas where IOC and ocean, as part of the ocean decade, we could work with other agencies like IFO and the other regulatory agencies to work on policy, guidelines, vigilance, and enforcement. And uh, we are trying to identify the list of existing initiatives. Uh, there are several of them, of course, uh, broadly on the international frameworks. We have considered that we have the SDGs and uh, standard framework for disaster reduction, some of pathway, and then the IMO, SOAS convention, etc. And then the regional programs and projects we have, you know, uh, warning systems like, like for the tsunami established by the IOC. We have WMO cyclone warning systems. We have projects by the WMO like the severe weather forecasting demonstration project. There's also a coastal inundation forecasting demonstration project. And there are agencies like UNFCAP, RIMES, and then of course the GEPCO CBEC 2030 project, which Paul also presented this morning. Then we have other IOC programs like the GOOSE, IODE, IOA2 in the Indian Ocean, IPHAP, IOPC, and then for example, we also have UNESCO Category 2 centers in the region. So these are some things which we should leverage uh, to actually do uh, the work of this uh, uh, under this group. And then uh, we also uh, consider that there are strong national observing programs which we should leverage on. Uh, each of the countries in the region have national observing systems, modeling and forecasting systems. So this is not an exhaustive list, but then uh, you know these are some things which we could really uh, work on. This is probably the last slide which is kind of recommendation. So we try to put these things together, potential initiatives uh, that need to be developed as part of the decade and then uh, some ideas on how that should be done. So what we find is actually we need to expand existing observations and promote new observations, new techniques actually. Uh, even for example, simple example of tide gauges. If you have a larger network of tide gauges, more denser network of tide gauges, just with the existing techniques, you could actually issue better warnings, be it for you know, tsunamis or storm surges, etc. So there's a need to expand that and then promoting new observations like smart cables and GNSS networks, etc. It could be, you know, uh, all those new observations. And modeling and forecasting capabilities. And then all this work, it was, uh, you know, discussed that we should be able to do it under a multi-hazard framework. Right now, there are individual warning systems, forecasting capabilities at different levels in different countries. But this is something we should aspire to. And then we should enable broader sharing of real-time data and information. Here we need technical and policy interventions because each uh, member state works on different, they might have different national policies. Uh, with the existing observation systems itself, if we are able to, you know, uh, work on technical and policy interventions, we might be able to, you know, receive, because we are talking about operational forecasting here. Uh, and then real-time data sharing is so very important actually for, uh, you know, for the safe ocean. And this is something, again, we need to develop and deliver user-specific, impact-based, simple, actionable warnings for multiple assets. And then we need to use wide range of communication tools, be it, you know, phones or social media, uh, all that, actually. And uh, how do we achieve this, actually? Uh, again, we had a lot of these discussions before, uh, over the past, in the, uh, you know, earlier working groups. I think these are common areas that uh, you know the decade really needs to you know give some guidance on. So how do we actually engage as as a disaster mitigation uh, you know community? We need to really network, have mechanisms to network with different stakeholders. And by stakeholders we mean user communities and user communities to define the requirement as well as you know taking the product back to them actually. So we need a strong uh, linkages with the user communities. And then, of course, the disaster managers. We as scientists really work on the upstream part of the work, enhancing observations, forecasting techniques, etc. But then that's the link. Uh, they are the real, uh, you know, uh, uh, interface uh, for us, for the technical agencies to reach the society. So we need to work with them. And of course, social scientists, when we talk about impact based and then actionable warnings, uh, you know, we need to really break down the technical information into simple warnings. So we need to really work with social scientists, which we have not, you know, as a regional system done uh, as well as we should have. And then international organizations, uh, national organizations, industry. I mean, we talked about private sector, NGOs, and all other stakeholders. We need this network. How do we establish this network is something we need to really 
uh, uh, the boss. And then we need to really again work with communities. We need to enhance preparedness, awareness, and response. We we discussed that unless the, the best warning you, you might be able to deliver, but then unless the community knows how to respond, unless they are aware, and then when we have communities here, it could be a wide range of communities. So we need to really bridge that gap. Uh, so there are certain community programs, uh, like community recognition programs, that is something which we could really draw on. Like for example, in tsunamis, we have something called Tsunami Ready. Uh, in the US, we have the weather ready program which uh, SIP uh, can uh, this, uh, provide information. Right, sir, sir. You uh, and then, so you whether we should be looking at some of And capacity building again, uh, cross cutting uh, issue. Uh, we have discussed this before. But then we found that this region is you know, having hosting two category two centers. Uh, so, how do we really leverage upon what is existing? To, so, maybe as part of the DK, we should be able to leverage this and then every other you know, opportunity that we have to really build capacities of all stakeholders across the region. And then uh, we need to formulate or participate in collaborative, collaborative projects to address specific issues. And that could be national initiatives. Like for example, we have heard uh, in the inauguration uh, three days back that you know the, uh, India has a you know, deep sea mission. Uh, uh, and similarly, several countries have several of their own national programs. And then how do we really leverage upon those programs uh, to really push our aspirations for the decade. And then uh, when we discussed in the IOC India workshop, we discussed about this project. There was a strong support for this postal vulnerability framework. So whether it is something you know which could be turned into a project proposal for the uh, next decade where we talk about you know all assessing the coastal vulnerability of countries in the region. And of course we have the tsunami warning project and uh, how do we actually improve upon. And then of course, CBEC 2030 can really deliver a lot of value to you know the bathymetry and topography. So how do we get engaged uh, as member states and organizations? Uh, and of course, the big big question about the financing, well, national, international, industry, you know, private sector. So how do we really uh, you know get uh, our initiatives uh, towards achieving a safe safe ocean finance? So that's about it, and uh, uh, thank you very much. There are some uh, uh, linkages with the earlier friction and smoking through that has established. And uh, another thing is the uh, initiatives. So several countries have a lot of initiatives, of course they are not listed, particularly with the guidelines, said, uh, again, guidelines and guidelines. Yes. So India has uh, some program for uh, tsunami or uh, for all disasters, for cyclones and uh, similarly for coastal uh, sustainability there, there are guidelines. So all those uh, guidelines are there. So we can take it through from that. Uh, uh, so I think these are the two, two yeah. points which came to my mind. Thank you very much. Actually, yeah, I also recall yesterday Khan's point that the safe portion really cuts across all the other uh, kind of uh, working group activities, yeah. which is uh, what you mentioned, especially with the prediction and uh, ocean prediction. Yeah, and of course I also note your comment on the guide and the other questions. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. thanks for the excellent presentation. Uh, you mentioned about the collision. So the collision between the fishing boats and the uh, commercial ships is becoming a big issue on the western coast of India. And you might be hearing from time to time. Uh, two years back, uh, the Bay of Bengal program and DG Shipping organized a national consultation in Chennai. And uh, with us, DG shipping also prepared the standard operating practices for the fishermen to follow, uh, to avoid or at least to minimize the accidents in sea. So there are standard operating practices uh, available, but the problem is, uh, you know, how to make them on a wider landscape and uh, uh, make the fishermen aware because uh, at this moment uh, the larger idea that comes from the fishermen is that sea is ours and you know we need a much wider space and 
as much as human needs to be, you know, they can, their corridors need to be far away in the sea. Yes. So I just wanted to make a point that uh, the standard operating practices are available. Then you raised this issue of uh, communication in several of your bullet points. Here again, you see, what I'm not talking for India. Uh, the standard practice is that if there is a human drive, give some communication equipment to the fishermen. That's not the end, you know. You want to set up a full process, which is not happening. Now, after the OK cyclone, uh, Tamil Nadu fishermen have been given satellite phones, but there is no process. So if I have fishermen 100 nautical miles or 200 nautical miles away from the coast, if he has a problem, to whom should he contact? And who should be his first line of contact and then you know, research and rescue? And all these things can only be set up if there is a process which uh, unfortunately we are not going into. We are just having the quick fix uh, type of uh, reaction and uh, providing these gadgets. We shouldn't have people because they can be able to. Thank you. Thank you on your slide. Yeah, thank you actually. Thank you, Dr. Yadavar. I think these are the exact issues that the working group discussed yesterday. In fact, we have the, uh, you know, uh, we have Dr. Sanjeev, who was actually well aware of these issues and that it was really, uh, he brought it to the notice of the working group. Otherwise, in fact, if this would have not, uh, you know, gone unnoticed in a sense, because what group felt was there was not much of scientific input that really is needed there. It's more kind of communication and the policy, exactly the kind of issues that you raised, regulation, etc. Uh, so that's the reason we put it in there, and then I think those are the gaps that we need to really at least raise, and then work with other organizations, agencies, national governments to really you know, uh, facilitate the process. Thank you, Shara. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for your presentation. Uh, what we are talking about is safety of ocean. So we should consider safety of society also, safety of communities who are living in the You have only mentioned response measures. Response measures, uh, uh, Mostly a short term response, an immediate response from the societies, how to make them safe. But we need an adaptation, a long term response and act for to make it safe for the society. Sometimes we make the right placement of the Sometimes we should adapt societies for the new strategy. Uh, I think we need to address this issue and more focus on this issue. Thank you. I totally agree with you actually. Response when we meant really for the response for the warnings, much shorter term, but then mitigation and long term planning is very important. We listed mitigation, but we are happy to really give it a bit more focus. I am sure that you should be asked. Thank you, Dr. Sikhoi. I think I'm going to raise the chair. Thank you. Oh, yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, presentation. I am also one of the participants in the group. But I would, I think, something that I have missed during the discussion. Uh, we are talking about the safety at ocean and the coast. The whole community of Maldives is actually a coastal community. Uh, sometimes we have we to say that we are in the ocean, in the middle of ocean. So in this regard, uh, lightning and thunderstorm is also a threat without uh, to the public. So I would like to add into the system because there are a lot of countries who already established the lightning network, but it has not extended up to the more this area. So I would like to comment to extend the lightning network to power our possible area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also thank our volunteers, uh, Mr. Mari Brothers and, uh, and Prasa uh, for actually taking notes and helping this group and all the group members. Thank you. And now the next session is a civil protection commission. But now, we're going to hear now the other one is a Thank you.
So that I can also read the other way, I'm on Sony. And I'd like uh, to thank Dr. Yadda for uh, drafting the report and uh, setting data uh, for providing all the uh, comments. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Yadda is going to present the report on our behalf. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, thanks the organizers for inviting the Bay of Bengal program to this uh, a very important uh, regional planning workshop. Uh, the group uh, in which I was in, uh, I would request if uh, my group colleagues could raise their hands so that uh, everybody can see who was there in the group. Ours was a small group, you know with a large bit topic to deal with. Uh, what we thought, you know, let's uh, first uh, talk about an objective or a vision, uh, largely aspirational, but uh, we thought we should have one. And we agreed on a sustainably harvested and productive ocean that would allow resources to be harvested on the basis of maximum sustainable yield and built on the pillars of intergenerational equity, principle of subsidiarity, partnership, gender justice, and following the precautionary approach. There could have been many pillars, but we thought these are some of the key pillars on which uh, we could perhaps uh, build our response. The first question, what are our regional specific priorities for the above objective or the vision? Uh, we get three uh, priorities uh, in this. The first priority was on sustainable harvesting of uh, fisheries resources that meet the needs of uh, human well-being for food, livelihood and economy of countries in the region. The second was on the ensuring the health and integrity of the ocean, of the coastal and marine resources, and particularly the ecologically and biologically sensitive areas such as uh, mangrove ecosystems, coral reefs, seagrass beds and coastal wetlands. So these resources continue to provide the ecosystem services for the well-being of oceans and human populations that depend on them. And the third specific priority was building resilience of coastal communities, in particular the fishers and the families from the vagaries of uh, events of extreme nature for example, cyclones, storm surges, rogue waves, etc. The previous speaker, in fact, also dwelt on this uh, topic. Then we went on to the, the gaps uh, that are need to be addressed. And here again, we highlighted three gaps. The first gap was on collection, collation, and dissemination of data information that covers fish production and productivity, the socio-economic aspects of coastal communities, coastal and marine resources and habitats and their mapping and trends in the ecosystem processes and other relevant attributes of the coastal and marine resources and their monitoring. And the second gap that we felt uh, should be highlighted here was understanding climate induced changes in the region and their impact on the marine living resources and the marine environment. And finally, addressing the needs of the community in accessing technology, capacity building, and in developing resilience and adaptation to climate-induced changes and other associated impacts. Uh, with these gaps, then we went on to the activities, uh, initiatives that are now being uh, carried on in the region. We didn't go into the specific uh, activities, neither did we mention the countries. But what we thought we could present a broad-based uh, uh, sort of suite of uh, initiatives. And these include study of physical and chemical properties of oceans and their correlation with biological productivity and other parameters that reflect on the health and integrity of oceans. Collection, collation and dissemination of data information relating to fish production and productivity and socio-economic aspects of communities conservation aspects of uh, marine living resources and also the EPSAs through seasonal, temporal, 
and area closures, harvesting restrictions, in particular the use of harmful and destructive air and trade bans. Then enforcing restrictions on fishing capacity that leads to over exploitation. Debt rate preventing and eliminating illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing practices. Development of technologies that help in improving the livelihoods of coastal communities and their well-being. Strengthening the resilience of communities in meeting the challenges posed by climate induced changes and helping them to adapt to newer technologies and practices for sustaining their livelihoods. And finally, moving towards the compliance of fisheries and environment related international instruments and agreements to which uh, parties, uh, countries are party to. Then we went on to the potential best in initiatives that need to be developed as a as part of the decade and here we have a slightly longer list and this includes fostering collaboration between institutes, agencies, intergovernmental organizations, civil society and non-governmental bodies on one hand and between governments in the region. On the other hand through MOUs, joint working groups and bilateral initiatives, building capacities of stakeholders at all levels especially in areas such as ecosystem approach to fisheries management, community-based area management and other conservation measures. Moving towards development of uniform standards in biological, oceanographic and related studies and investigations and in better understanding the ecosystem services that the oceans and their associated resources, example mangroves, coral reefs, seagrass beds provide to the human beings and undertaking joint fishery stock assessment in the exclusive economic zones and cooperation in sharing of uh, resources such as survey vessels etc. Some countries in the region have a good number of survey vessels, others do not have. So I think this collaboration would be very important and uh, we also need to have a joint uh, planning in the stock assessment uh, in the region. Then setting up of platforms, hubs for data and information storage and retrieval, use of equipment and other facilities on mutually agreed terms and conditions, and easy access of information to end users. Promoting stakeholder cooperation and engagement, especially at the practitioner's level, to promote networking and exchange of knowledge, including sharing of traditional knowledge. Organizing policies and programs, especially in areas of ocean related studies and investigations. And this should be both for marine living and non living resources. Developing common approaches in dealing with matters concerning implementation of resolutions from regional fisheries management organizations. One of the key regional fisheries management organizations is the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission and other international agreements and arrangements to which member countries are party to. And uh, if we look at the concept note, uh, some of the international agreements are listed over there. For example, UNCLOS, Sendai Framework, Samoa uh, Initiative and uh, a few others. And some of the, the non-binding ones, for example, the 1995 FAO's Code of Conduct for Responsible Improving safety at sea of fishermen through introduction of cost-effective technologies in communication, navigation and personal flotation devices. Taking knowledge to the grassroots using suite of approaches and the examples are documents in vernacular language because if you have to take things down to the grassroots, you can't take them in English, you know, you have to take them in the local languages. Simplify them and then translate them in the local languages. Videos, animation films. My organization is quite popular in this particular area and we have been very effectively using comic books in uh, uh, communication and uh, dissemination of information. And uh, before lunch, you know, you had these two young ladies, uh, students, and we, said, uh, we also said that catching them young, reaching educational institutes, colleges, schools, etc. And uh, I think I'm coming to the last two bullets. 
sourcing funds from GF for implementing a large marine ecosystem project for countries surrounding the Arabian Sea, inner Orkney Sea area and other associated marine areas. Uh, I stand corrected, but as far as I know, uh, most of the LMEs have some or the other program going on, GF supported. Uh, but the Arabian Sea and that particular area doesn't have any GEF supported enemy program and I think it would be a good uh, initiative if uh, uh, best thing is if some countries join hands and ask you know one of the UN agencies it could be uh, you know if FAO if it's a fisheries uh, it could be FAO or UNEP to formulate a GEF uh, funding program for international waters or biodiversity which are, whichever theme is, uh, uh, funds are available in this cycle of funding. And finally, raising the profile of environment and fisheries issues using print and electronic media. I think uh, uh, the environment, the oceans, fisheries, they don't make much news and that's how they don't get uh, into the print media. Uh, in the Indian case, uh, I think after the COP, uh, CBD COP which was held in Hyderabad, when newspapers did bring out some uh, information on what's happening. Uh, we rarely get, uh, uh, you know, good articles and good write-ups in the newspapers that can sort of stimulate your conscious and also stimulate the politicians. Uh, so I think that's uh, quite important. And, uh, uh, we thought uh, five is covered by four, so and, uh, one just small bullet point was that we need good regional cooperation. Uh, uh, chair of my group and members, if you have to add anything, uh, please do so. But otherwise, uh, I conclude here. Those, those 
facilities available in various stages of development. Um, and also keep in mind that just going from freely available fisheries uh, or moving to freely available fisheries data is, is a sensitive um, process and, and needs some careful consideration. Um, finally, I'll just uh, say that uh, under most RFMOs, the member countries would say that they already do currently. Um, they sit in the same room, the scientific committees usually sit in the same room for two weeks and deliberate together and then the commissioners sit in the same room and spend ten days deliberating together. So there's just some careful language that needs to be made around those kind of recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I think uh, almost all the countries in the region are providing their fisheries data to FAO and FAO cleans that data and then puts it on its uh, uh, portal for countries and others to access. But uh, the, there's uh, you know, huge data gap and uh, more and more we see that the NEI species you know, which are not taxonomically identified, their numbers are increasing and uh, in some cases, you know, you have 50% of the statistics covered with listed species and the remaining 50% goes into NEI. And the seas around us from the University of British Columbia, they also pick up the data, they clean it and they put it on their uh, portals. Uh, so, uh, we are aware that there are, you know, existing, but my group was of the view that, you know, we should have. Uh, and I understand it's, you know, uh, as scientists we might be agreeing to so many things, but when commissioners sit across the table, they shoot down everything, you know, and then say, oh, no, it's not possible. Yeah. Thank you very much for your comments. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you for this presentation. I have two points. Uh, one is that uh, you have mentioned uh, the collection of data and uh, having specific regulations and policies uh, uh, so that one uh, of them are good. So it's uh, in color. Uh, just I want to add uh, uh, one point. Uh, Combating illegal fishing it, it will make uh, this nature more strong. Uh, uh, having this provision and this document, I think it, 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 Make it more strong. I can say that competing illegal uh, fishing uh, with specific measures at the national and regional level. At the, at the, region, at the regional level, also we need some coordination and cooperation, otherwise, uh, it will be difficult to have uh, uh, proper management of uh, uh, marine resources. Uh, one other point is uh, you mentioned sourcing of funds from GAF. I don't know why this is the reason that we have the meeting to source of funds to only GAF. We have another source of funds also. It's good that we have uh, 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 from GAF, GCF, and other international uh, donors. Uh, so, uh, uh, because it's available, you know, maybe we, we can have it today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think for everybody else, you had three points. For me, you had only two points. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, sir, just a minute. I would respond to his uh, issue of the IUU fishing. So, in case of my member countries, we have already developed the national plan of action on IUU, and uh, we are now into the process for developing the regional plan of action on IUU. And in fact, uh, uh, after 15th, I was supposed to have the first meeting for the development plan for the regional IUU. The draft framework is already ready and uh, we need to start, uh, you know, the commissioners need to start coming and meeting and finalizing. So we are quite ahead in this process of IUU. And I, I did avoid the GCF, you know, because many countries in the region have already sourced large amount of GCF funding. For example, India has already got 200 million US dollars under the GCF fund. And GCF then again would not give funds in which a country is uh, listed. So, but GF funding 
or the Arabian Sea is still available and if a large marine ecosystem project can be formulated, I think the JEF funding can be made available. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Chair, perfect silence. Some may be to the presenter. I am working in the same room. Uh, I think the, uh, also the, the message that we actually wanted to pass on is an idea of a sustainability hub sort of thing which Dr. Yase actually uh, promoted and then he said that this hub is not only for data sharing, it's also sharing of ideas, sharing of uh, instruments, sharing of uh, uh, logistics because there are many countries in the region which are which need capacity building as well as they may not have uh, resources to this sort of thing. Uh, so it's uh, Dr. Khan, I was listening to, uh, and this is not exclusively a platform for only data sharing. This is a, a, a more of a holistic platform. That's, that's probably a one big country. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, yeah, but the discussion was only on the okay. data, share, data sharing. That's, that's, that is because she was telling that we do not need to reinvent the wheel. So this is, this is more of a holistic approach. Probably we have uh, the message has got to be cut on this. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a minute. I think it's a little bit better. Sorry. Yes. Um, I just want to return to um, the IUU fishing point. So, from a research perspective, a science perspective, there's a lot of emerging technology, a lot of which has come from ocean monitoring, which is being applied to tackle IUU, uh, plus the satellite. Um, initiatives, Global Fishing Watch and Ocean Mind, which are also making data available for research purposes. Um, so I think that as an opportunity, a lot of it is still at the proof of concept stage from a technology and research point of view, but I think it's something that we could really make substantial progress on over the decade if this was something for the group. Uh, to consider. Another aspect of IU fishing, I'm aware of um, two PhD students only working on this topic, and there may be more, is the social and economic drivers behind IU fishing. What makes people do these activities and where they poach, which is a regional issue, not, not just a local issue. And finally, one more thing which a briefing paper has gone to IOTC is on drifting fish aggregation devices. Um, there's some modeling work also happening on that um, at the national level. And I think it's an issue that starts moving fish um, away from well-managed areas um, and it makes them very exposed to illegal fishing activities. So perhaps we might, uh, I can send through some notes, further notes on that, but I just wanted to make those points around IUU fishing. Yeah, that would be excellent. Uh, and uh, just to share with the house, uh, you know, one of the union territories on the west coast of India, known as Lakshadweep, uh, it again has a very small complement of uh, staff in the fisheries department. And they're using drones, you know, to see the illegal fishing boats. And each of their survey boat, you know, has a drone. And they're using it to capture very wide areas and to see whether unfriendly boats are present in the region or not. So that's but but then taking that through to prosecution has another set of challenges. Here. So there's the identification is one issue, but the government processes about what happens next is another part of this. So I think this is a very strong opportunity for the science policy and government interface and, and for us to help with that potentially. Thank you. Uh, so I think you're good. Uh, an excellent job of capturing the, the main priority that we're discussing. Uh, one of the ones that I, I just want to know, the data, the data stream required uh, to uh, assess fish production and productivity and supply, uh, all for the sake of developing a management solution for fisheries, uh, are incredibly resource intensive. And the capacity for uh, the increased capacity to maintain something like that on an ongoing basis is going to vary significantly around the region. Uh, to that end, I think it would be worth noting that uh, we should also be looking at pursuing uh, data limited management scenarios for fisheries. Um, and, but there are programs like that that exist right now that we can be building from, but I think there's a lot of work that can be done now. Thank you.
Thank, thank you very much. function but also a technical uh, di digestion function in getting us to this point. So thanks Dr. Panda, I really appreciate it. There you are. Okay. Cheers. Um, so uh, we, uh, we really were able to get this through this very quickly because a lot of what would come from uh, a working group like this is really are really things that have been thought of already. You know, there's really nothing new in this. So we tried to concentrate on a few high-level, uh, high-level um, uh, objectives, and, and also come up with a couple of statements that uh, we feel are overarching statements. So, in terms of region-specific priorities, we felt that there needs to be an inventory of what ecological and threatening substance data and information is, is available for all of the constituents of the Indian Ocean, all of the countries. And, you know, we talked about, you know, we focused on biological, physical, climatic, uh, socioeconomic data, threatening substances, you know, contaminants, rubbish, nutrients, and also threatening species. And then we, 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 we discussed, we, we focused on the issue that in terms of ensuring there is data and information management uh, to support sustainable development, uh, under the decade. One would think that the decade should focus on improving the capacities of all of the Indian Ocean countries in the realm of data and information management. But in order to do that, one has to assess where each of the individual countries sit on, on the curve of, of, uh, of expertise and preparedness for data and information management. So a very critical but very expensive exercise if it's done properly is an assessment of the capacity of all Indian Ocean constituents in data and information management and sharing. And uh, there was a point made not to forget that an assessment of national laws and protocols on data sharing across DEZs and within DEZs is something that needs to be borne in mind. Then we, then we turned our attention to what are the gaps that need to be addressed. And we, we quite simply could do no better but say, look at, look at section one, because what comes out of section one uh, basically tells us what gaps. However, we also suggested that there should be a reference in the report to the other five working groups, because you know, data and information management, I think, crosses all of the other five themes. And um, there was a specific point made about ocean literacy, I mean, uh, constituents need to be literate in data and information management, not just in understanding reports, protocols, guidelines, operating procedures, but also, uh, you know, the data per se. And then uh, the point was made about standardised standardisation of data collection and monitoring methodologies and protocols. Then we went on to listing existing initiatives that are oriented towards the priorities identified in one and two, and of course one could. One could probably prepare a 20 page report listing all the initiatives in programs, in countries, in institutions. But we did pick a few out as exemplars, really. But one I wanted to bring to the forum's attention is something called the Ocean Information Hub. And that's been, that's something very new. In fact, it hasn't yet been developed into an operational program. But uh, the Ostend office has got money from the Belgian government to create an Ocean Information Hub, which is basically an IOC clearinghouse mechanism for the transfer of marine technology powered by proof of concept 
ocean data information system architecture, and it was motivated by the IOC's group of experts on capacity development, which means 150 member states of the IOC supported and led to the creation of the Ocean Information Hub. Of course, there's the IODE, there are national networks, there's program networks like the INCOIS Hyderabad Data and Information Management System for the IOE2, etc., etc. Argo, Goose, Rama, they all have data and information management elements to them. And as cases in point that you know are worth uh, referring to, there's the Global Ocean Acidification Network, Observing Network, that's an excellent example, JEPCO, and you know, there are many, many more. Potential initiatives, network partnerships that need to be developed. Well, many initiatives will be identified from the priorities listed in a section one above. Improving the efficiency of the international ocean data and and uh, the international oceanographic data and information uh, exchange program would be worth pursuing because you know the IOD is, is in fact been set up exactly for the purpose that was being discussed in this thematic working group. Uh, an identification of potential private agencies uh, which have different data collection models and, and they have appropriate accreditation of data quality. Uh, the development of data and information management networking infrastructure with complementary human resources, etc., etc. Then, what was our view for achieving the above? Well, a specific, uh, you know, a specific in terms of taking advantage of you know modern contemporary social media mechanisms was mentioned as cost-effective and convenient. Uh, the promotion of innovative low-cost technologies, and then, then we took a breath and said. You know, really, the above mentioned objectives are really not new. You know, when you sit down and talk about data and information management, I mean, it's been talked about for two, three, four decades in the context of ocean observations and, and services. The real issue, and you know, this is a repeat of what we've been mentioning all week, is the need for resources for effective, tangible, material actions to address the issues with these and with these as reaffirmed objectives for the decade, the decade must be used to advocate for and lever appropriate levels of enabling investment, patient in kind. And I'm not going to labour this because I think it, you know, it, it's come up in the context of the other groups. I'm happy to take questions on it. But, and and that, 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 those resources should rightfully come from private and public sources. And then as a closing thought, we, we make the point that it's absolutely imperative that emphasis is always placed on, and this, I mean, Ed emphasised this right up front this week, placed on ensuring that users, including decision makers as stakeholders, are canvassed, are, are, are asked right up front in terms of what their own priorities are for data and information management. So, in other words, go to the users first and, get, and then work backwards. That's basically where we got. So you know, we didn't get into the fine detail because we believe that that detail exists in, in plenty of other documents and, uh, and, and initiative reports. That's where we're at. Thank you. Thank you for the
Practically, you know, they should be exposed to the ocean and oceanography you know, in order to appreciate and if they want to accept as their you know, career. And all. For that, uh, in fact, you know, what is happening is that under you know, bilateral programs and all, there is a lot of involvement of uh, actually the Ministry of External Affairs and they get into picture, they write, keep writing correspondence and a couple of them would like to go to that country and spend some good time and come back and again make it, you know. In reality, you know, when it gets translated into action, it takes about three years and then you may, you know, send some 12 students or 15 students get exposed. Here, if you can actually get a, a mechanism in place for that, you know, our region as a whole, I think to IOC and all, it is actually, see, I, although I you know, worked also in the shoes of a bureaucrat, but a scientist was always a you know, good option. His way of doing is always quick. And it is always, you know, uh, result uh, oriented. Then to a bureaucrat. Therefore, I strongly feel is that here, the kind of, you know, resources you have in the Indian Ocean, for example, about bringing them together. And, you know, who requires this exposure? That is, you know, one thing, in fact, uh, actually, modern Chester also was asking, actually, you know, mentorship and all. That, you know, mentorship, you know, one is that online mentoring is different. <coughs> then at sea mentoring is different. That we can have some kind of, you know, selection, selection process, go through that process quickly, get them through, so that in a decade, you should say, actually, at the end of the day, a decade, you should say proudly, aha, I have a trained man for about 1,000 people or 500 people, something like that you know you can devise. That's what is you know, I thought I could share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think we are not stuck and covered most of what I wanted to say. Uh, having said that, is it possible from this group to get a, a kind of handlistic of non contentious issues where transparency can be established? and kind of shared, made accessible. I mean, that's one of the thoughts that uh, maybe you can consider. If not right now, it would be useful, I think. 
I, I, I suspect that um, there are not nine other regional planning workshops, and I'm sure even, even the exemplars that we've listed here, if we then examine the outputs of the other nine workshops, those exemplars will probably go from four to 40. So it'll be very interesting to see, to, to note the consolidation of all of the respective inputs and thought processes of the other workshops. But I'm saying the answer, the answer to your question is yes, it should be possible, and I think partially addressed by looking at the other results. But you know, I'm not throwing the, the ball to another bowler. There are a few more uh, things which we have to do before we finally buy that. What is uh, there are some issues which are cross cutting before the beginning itself when the discussion came as far as financing is concerned. So, two points have emerged one is uh, about uh, funding, next one is on capacity. These have to be discussed and it is necessary for all of them. I request Pater to make note of this, this, this thing, Pater on the road this is, because it's a common thing for the people. Are there any other uh, points or uh, issues which are common to all the teams which we have here left out by any means or something like that? We have to just uh, identify those and then we will, we will add in our final results. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think that um, beyond the hard skills and technical skills, which are very important for the UK, there are also soft skills that are not generally not uh, uh, some countries and some uh, organs are not uh, interested in. So I can see that bringing uh, these tools uh, in, uh, for example, intensive workshops will help in capacity building. So there are some different uh, kind of uh, uh, topics that could be used. Uh, for example, networking skills, uh, non-violent communication skills, how to manage conflict, best way to communicate, I don't know, public speaking. So in many countries and in many organizations, it's very, very important to empower young and even less young people with such uh, skills. So I can, if you wish, I can write a small paragraph on that. Uh, when we are actually uh, inviting the people to engage in oceanography research and developing that area, the main question as a faculty we are facing is that uh, why would we be fitted after we talk about care? So, those opportunities or the career opportunities are not. Some of them might help me, we are not uh, still uh, skilled enough. Uh, doing so many research. But we have uh, 12 universities who are offering oceanography. And most of the students are doctors. After, after graduation, they are going to bank or they are going to uh, NGO, some of them. And most of them are trying for government jobs, like administrative jobs. So now, interested students are actually becoming less. I mean, uh, in 1996, when I appeared at the University for Admission Test, we took almost 30,000 students for 46 in oceanography and science. But now we have lots of departments in oceanography, but the students are paying like 6,000, 4,000 pounds. So that's a, that's a trend for the future. I mean, yeah. Because in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, we have only one oceanography research institute who can be starting for the new people. Why is it going to come? So perhaps uh, they can go. Or why they can go? So, uh, can it be included uh, that in national jobs, like that are actually opportunities, efficiency research, or environmental research, or climate change, or green economy, even in banking, 
they can be treated. But why did they give that advertisement for recruitment? They actually uh, mentioned you can apply the students who have background from economics, from uh, physics or chemistry, they can apply. But oceanography or medicine is not included. So they cannot apply. So that could be an issue, especially for our team. Okay, good. The priority is one of the factors. We can put that case. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I forget another question. Um, we have experience with e learning tools. Uh, with, so I think that in the capacity building topic in ocean literacy, uh, within the frame of the UN decade, e learning, developing some uh, courses like spoke MOOCs. Uh, and using the platform to share information, to share courses, will be useful for all the community all over the world. So this is uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So after reflecting uh, for the last three days, as you said, uh, the common thing for all the all the uh, um, teams, as a student was learning self learning system. Focus. We have to focus on that. What the literacy is common for all the things. There only is a philosophy from two, as I mentioned, finance, philosophy. Another one is philosophy for knowledge sharing without expecting anything in return. Okay, I will teach you very many law. No. I will teach you voluntarily because this is a duty. So, philosophy from sharing knowledge. Then critic uh, has to learn from others. See, um, in any country that is some uh, gap in learning knowledge, please give, give it to uh, IOC, this is the idea you want to learn. So even if you are discussing who is in the higher part, but we, we did not learn anything uh, from, from that point of view. So countries, please give this is the idea you want to learn. So let them collect all this information, share, then that is what we have to do. So this particular element is missing. And then finally, finally, uh, as we are all discussing, uh, quality data and mechanism for sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are two points that I think they are consulting for the capacity building in case that I will not uh, elaborate on that. So we need to shift from capacity building on building on capacity. Because there are existing capacities, we need to build on the existing capacity to get to a higher level. So that's a shift of paradigm that we need to start to work on. You know, because capacity building is a continuous activity. Because science and technology is building within the world, then the capacity will be changing. But we are not changing the capacity, we are building on existing capacity. That's how our government the sector will be prepared to invest to follow the trend in the evolution of uh, science and technology innovation. The second point that I believe in particular in Sardinia, which is constructing, is data use because everything we do is related to data. And uh, from the first day to now, everybody has talked about data. So data management should not be considered as a separate and silo component. It should be considered as a strategy. Now, the next point that it is fundraising. It's not only about the data. It's not only about the fundraising. And uh, this is the three point I believe we should integrate in the reports. First, great for capacity. Second, data issues. Third, fundraising. But we are found in the private sector. So, those uh, private sector of city that are really willing to be committed to the workers, how to prepare ourselves and work with them. And I'm very happy to hear this morning that Dr. Mudaba said that he is a very good that I said to you. I keep expanding on funding mechanisms. Positive 
These networks will, for, will foster academic, scientific research, and communities engagement in the decade. So the regional data requirements for the UN decade taking into consideration the huge demand for all the data archived in the region as many publication and dissertation works have emerged from the heterogeneous data archived at INCOIS and at uh, national level, the workshop called for the reactivation of the audit syndrome. I will see NGO priority areas for the UNDK. The approved work plan for, for IOCNDO is the priority action plan for the UN decade implementation in the region. The following is considered as immediate flagship programs for implementation. The flagship programs for the UN decade, the first one is the regional framework of, for coastal vulnerability towards the safety, security, and sustainable development of member states in the Indian Ocean. The second, ocean plastic. Three, the tsunami early, early warning in the Indian Ocean. And four, inventory with knowledge gaps in existing programs, studies, and researches, maximizing their wide and equitable usage towards the UN decade success. The follow-up mechanism for the preparation and implementation of the UN decade in the Indian Ocean, a working group composed of the co-chairs, rapporteurs, and Speakers of the thematic, the working group of the workshop together with the IOC NDO officers and the technical secretary will act as the planning working group for the region. The working group will mobilize international and regional stakeholders with relevant programs and networks in the further uh, progress of the UN decade in the region. Thank you. I would like to add at this point in time and start with the bottom place. We want this team which has been created now as the working group with the chair, the co-chair, rapid chair and the, uh, the, the speakers who did it in their first day. This should continue up to up to which year actually, can you guess what the year was? 2030, yes, up to 2030. The team should be in action till 2030. Because otherwise there is no point. I mean, let us see that it can go. So, I don't care the time till that we should go. So my request would be that uh, you, uh, each group, please be fully aligned with that. And uh, the secretary will be common, even though the chair or vice chair may change uh, over a period of time. But the secretary will be common and uh, Justin will be there in the pretty My question was uh, also how we to do uh, who are in the people <laughs> So I I I feel I mean, of course now jokes apart, I feel that it is essential that the team which has been formed here should go strongly. Otherwise, this will, as I told you uh, on the first day, uh, after today evening, uh, you all will go to the respective countries and uh, everything will be just will get evaporated. So that should not happen. So please keep in case you are not seeing got the email addresses and WhatsApp numbers, please do that. And I again say that I mean. Already it has been indicated that you should use social media for various purposes. Big uh, Steve has indicated. I request all these working groups uh, have a, a WhatsApp group and uh, the, the, you start exchanging uh, messages, not just good morning, because in India we have got a tendency to keep on sending good morning and good evening messages, <laughs> just like that, which is of no use. but. We will have a solid interaction with uh, very scientific uh, aspects discussed and exchanged. So that when we know about other programs which are coming in the region, we should be able to immediately contact all and go ahead. So my permanent request would be the heads who are here of each of these so-called chairs, what I, what I mean is that the chairs please form the groups and the, the chairs uh, the, the WhatsApp numbers you please share with us uh, so that uh, myself, Justin, and uh, my team here, team, so that we also will be able to disseminate information to all of you easily. 
So one thing with uh, due respect to IOC and all our member states, I should say, our system, as well as the IOC system, is highly bureaucratic. The, the, the letters or so-called circulars, circular letters as they very, very in a standard form they call it, that circular letter will be sent and it will never reach the right person. I will tell you, I have never got a circular letter from IOC which has been sent to our ministry or wherever it goes to be. I get it because we have direct contact with IOC, so we get the mails. Otherwise, never ever, even though we have been working so much strongly with IOC, we never get it. I, I am sure that that is a case with other countries also, because there is a gap between uh, the bureaucratic setup and the scientific setup. But anyway, we, we cannot solve all these problems uh, uh, in this forum. So, what I am requesting is that let us use this type of technology and try to keep in touch. So, this is my request. So, at least six uh, WhatsApp numbers, I am sure, before going today, I will get for Usha so that we can use it only for this purpose. Please don't that this thing we are not sharing any personal details or anything or anything for that matter. It's only for purely for scientific work. Please use this one. And now we come to the last uh, session, so to say, where the, oh sorry, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Very, very briefly, uh, I love the idea of this working group. Uh, I would like a little bit more action oriented by saying we meet regularly. Because that's sort of open up. I think we should meet regularly. I would recommend we take advantage of the opportunity to go by the park for those of us who are going to be in the open in March to build uh, yeah. yeah. yes. 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 and to do thank you. So we've got a report. Now I am sent it to you. The guy who gave me the <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> So working, combining formal and informal way of working together, scientific progress. Thank you very much for that. Mr. Chair, is this the final recommendation list of no, no, it will come up, it will come up. If we are going to run it, that, that does not start it, so to say. It will come up in there. So the only point is, uh, because I have seen your odd member states are not here, what we will do is we will send this to all the IOC member states and uh, wait for a strict period of time to get any further inputs. And if we get any inputs, we will modify it by this. Otherwise, we will take this as a party. So now that this part is over, now the last session is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just hope that already in the world. Let's take it first. I think the three point one, two, three, four. There's nothing mentioned of biological resources. Uh, I think uh, it's important that it's reflected in the right place. There's uh, protection measures, biodiversity assessment, and uh, the fisheries regulation that has to be reflected in either as 3.5 or anywhere you want to be. Okay. And uh, the other uh, 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 Show me where say about the BPO member states and partners can be specified in the partners that are specifically in the world of designing the states after and once they are participated. I think that should be. Included. <laughs> 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 Yes, 
So the uh, last uh, session would be on the finalizing the report. So the report, uh, I should thank uh, our lead uh, owners of the report for cut out from all the uh, chairs and the uh, rapporteurs. Dr. Sapat, Dr. Venkatesan, Dr. Tegamani, Dr. Yasser, all of them they have put their heads together and the report is ready. And uh, my friend, of course, Dr. Venkatesan would be presenting that. The actual text of the report, we are not going into detail in a, uh, uh, like yesterday, we were talking that would really necessarily take a lot of time, that's we are not going into. We are not, we are going only into the text of the key recommendations and important things. Dr. Uh, Vengrasen, if you are ready, you can... No, no, it will take some time. Some time, okay, just we will ask for some time. Thank <laughs> you. 